Podcast. It's the marketing podcast for podcasters. Build a big podcast. I'm David Hooper. This podcast is all about growing your podcast audience, building a podcast that people care about, making money with your podcast. And few people have done that better than my guest. She's known as Grammar Girl. Her real name, Ming Yong Fogarty. She's got a brand new book. It's called The Grammar Daily, 365 Tips for Successful Writing. A big part of what we do as podcasters, we're trying to get a message to people. And we're trying to do that in the most efficient and most impactful way possible. Words are part of that. And you are being judged on your grammar, just like we're judged on our sound. People are judging you by the way you speak and the quality of that speech. So a book like this, The Grammar Daily, 365 Quick Tips for Successful Writing, it will also help you as a podcaster, even if you never write a book. Ming Young's been around for a while. Speaking of books, she was in my book, Big Podcast. And the reason I did that, when you look up The Grammar Girl Podcast, you'll see her as a cartoon. I thought, oh, this is brilliant. She's made herself into a character. and She's got a network. It's called Quick and Dirty Tips, several podcasts, each of them hosted by a character who's a real person. But also, if that person ever gets sick of doing podcasts, she can switch them in and out because it's based on the character. And we're going to get deeper into that in this conversation. We're also going to talk about podcasting versus journalism. We're going to talk about deadlines. We're going to talk about communicating with written word versus communicating with spoken word. We're talking about building authority. We're talking about finding success, spreading your message. We're talking about the success that she has had. New York Times bestselling author. She was the second female in the Podcasting Hall of Fame. She's been on Oprah. We're talking about the good, bad, and ugly of partnerships. We're talking about style of metrics. What is that? We're talking about it. And she talks about this, all of the success that she's had based around her podcast. You're going to get a lot out of this. This episode is brought to you by Focusrite. You've seen those red boxes in podcasting studios? That's the Scarlet series of Focusrite interfaces. That's what I'm talking into now. Well, I'm talking into a mic. Then it goes into the Scarlet 4i4. Then it goes into my computer. Like I just said, people are judging you by how you sound. If you want to sound great, and this will make any mic sound better. One of the things people don't understand about preamps, because that's basically what this interface is. It's a preamp. You're overdriving it. You're working it too hard. But not the Scarlet power for any mic. Imagine driving a truck. You've got a trailer, a heavy load it's straining, straining, straining. It might get you up the hill, but it's having to work really hard. You want a powerful truck, one that's going to get you up the hill easily and safely. That's what the Scarlet does for your mic. It's got enough power to drive any mic that you will put on it. Even the Shure SM7B. Clean gain that's going to make your voice sound like a million bucks. And here's the best part. Scarlet interfaces, they've got one for every budget. There's a reason when I mentioned a red box in the podcasting studio, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The Scarlet Interface is the best-selling interface in the world. Don't take my word for it. Try it out for yourself. Go to focusrite.com. They've got more information about the options. Again, one for every budget. You want a quick, easy, and inexpensive way to sound better? Get a Focusrite Scarlet. They're available worldwide wherever you get your audio equipment. And you get more information at focusrite.com. F-O-C-U-S-R-I-T-E.com. Here's my interview with Ming Yang Fogarty. We've got a background in journalism, and I've thought about this a lot Right before COVID happened, I got invited to speak at a journalism conference. And I said, I'm not a journalist. <laughs> I'm not a gen- mm-hmm. No, no, you are. You are. I want to talk about that first, podcasting and journalism. How do you define journalists, first of all? You're what I think journalists would describe as a citizen journalist. You and I are, aren't affiliated with you know, a news organization that can defend us if we get in trouble with right. libel or something like that. But we're out there doing a lot of the things that journalists do, interviewing people, gathering information and packaging up in a way for listeners or readers. So, you know, that is a basic core of what journalists do. And now everyone can do that. That, That's what I remember thinking when I first discovered podcasting so many years ago. I thought podcasting is to radio what blogs are to print publications. Blogs let people publish without a gatekeeper in the way that they couldn't do before that. You had to get some editor to accept your material to get it in front of people. And with blogs, you could just go straight to the people. And then podcasting was the same thing. But for audio, it was like you didn't need a radio station to sanction that what you wanted to say was worth hearing. You could just go out there and say it. And it just I knew it was going to be revolutionary. Let's talk about the pros and cons of that. One of the things that I've found working with musicians is that because they can go directly to people. They don't have the filters. Like somebody say, oh, you might want to say not say that. Mm-hmm. So that obviously has pros and cons going directly to people. 
what do we need to watch out for maybe that you wouldn't have had to watch out for working for a traditional newspaper, for example? I think it just means that there is a lot of content that people have to sift through and decide on their own what is quality. And that can be hard. But, I mean, it, you can tell with the audio and the quality of the work in the sense that you're experiencing it. It's harder to judge the quality of the facts. Right, because people judge you on the sound of your voice and how well things are recorded. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. But it's it's much harder for the listener to judge whether what you're saying is true or not. Right. Um, right. Yeah, because you don't have that masthead. You don't have the traditional outlet, the filters to actually get the message out. Right. Not that, that traditional publications don't make mistakes all the time. <laughs> you know, like you should not believe anything blindly, but I think it's more of a problem when you're dealing with an individual as opposed to an organization. You went to J school, they call it? I didn't. I, I have an undergraduate degree in English. I was a professor at a J school. Okay. So you've, you've been around, around J school. I want to talk about deadlines and speed because that's one of the things that I've known from the journalists that I've worked with, that they are very quick. Fast. Turnaround. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what do you think about that when it comes to your podcast? The once a week schedule works pretty well for me, <laughs> but I'm not doing breaking news. You know, there's not a lot of breaking grammar news. <laughs> you know, if I were doing a podcast about something more news related, you know, podcast or stocks or sports or something like that, then I think it's important to get that information out there as soon as you can. Has it changed your approach, like hanging around with all those journalists, what you think about deadlines? Do you have a deadline, for example, like every Monday this podcast comes out or you just put it out whenever you want to? Oh, yeah. No, no. My podcast comes out on a very strict deadline. The entire time I've been doing it, I don't think I've ever missed one of my weekly deadlines. I have missed my internal deadlines all the time. And, you know, the poor people who work with me sort of know that things get done at the last minute sometimes, but we have never missed a publication deadline. I think a couple of times maybe things didn't go out when they should have because of technical problems, right. but I have never missed a deadline. And, and I'm a very deadline-driven person. I find it really hard to do anything without a deadline. Like if somebody isn't expecting someone from me, then like I probably won't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so external deadlines. Yeah. And that's been my problem. You know, I t I've talked for years about wanting to write fiction and I, I, I don't think I ever will because you have to write it before someone wants it. And uh, that for me, yeah. psychologically is a huge problem. Well, OK, so let's talk about that because I've written books and I have I had a deal which I the book was never put out. Uh, and, and after that situation, a lot of it because of having somebody else be in control of what I wanted to do, I was like, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've done self-publish, but self-publish means no deadlines. And I'm curious with you, you've always had other people with your books giving you deadlines and that's been beneficial? Yeah, always. CNN's called your podcast a quick and dirty success. I want to break this down. Uh, first of all, is that true? Quick and dirty, that's the name of the network. Right. That may be why they called it that, but do you think that you've been a quick and dirty success? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Well, first, let's go back. Quick and dirty is a phrase that my mom used to use when I was growing up. So she'd say, like, let's do a quick and dirty job on these dishes, you know, before we go to bed, just get them started, you know, or something like that. So it meant doing something sort of the bare minimum, what you needed to do to get the job done is my interpretation of what quick and dirty means. Yeah. Well, that's how I live my life. <laughs> yeah. So when I started, I didn't want to do a really long, in-depth podcast about language, I wanted to give people quick and dirty tips that would help them write better. Here is how you use a semicolon. Here's the difference between affect and effect. Right. Actionable. You can put it in there today. Right. You know, it's like doing the dishes before you go to bed. It's like, let's learn how to use a semicolon. And so that's sort of the philosophy. And then the show itself actually was surprisingly a quick and dirty success. You hear a lot of people say like, oh, an overnight success doesn't happen. But for me with Grammar Girl, it actually kind of did. You started what year? It was 2005, 2006. Kind of the forefront of podcasting. Do you think that had something to do with it? Just fewer people doing podcasts? Yeah. It was interesting because my background is in English and writing, but I did a weird detour into um, science. I have a master's in biology and I was a science writer before I was Grammar Girl. And so I had a science podcast for about eight months before I did Grammar Girl. You know, it did okay, but it wasn't 
anything I was going to do full time. And then when I switched to doing Grammar Girl, within six weeks, it was number one or number two at iTunes. I mean, it just it like went wild. So in, in the category or just all over? Overall, like of all podcasts in the world, you know, it was like This American Life, Grammar Girl, CNN. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was... Back then, now I started that, but we were doing it as part of a, a broadcast radio show. So it was more or less radio on the internet. We were kind of figuring out what podcasting meant to us. And back then, there were a lot of what I call ramble cast, mm -hmm. which was just some guy with a dictaphone well, I'm going to go shopping today. And oh man, <laughs> beans are on sale for 89 cents. You know, and I feel like every episode I've ever heard from you, you're obviously super organized. You're a writer. Teaching at the J schools helped you to organize your thoughts. I, I feel like that probably had something to do with it, that you actually took things to a new level and very few people were doing that because we were still figuring out podcasting at that time. Yeah, it was kind of a reaction against those shows. I loved podcasting, but I, I just, I would get tired of listening to people ramble. <laughs> and um, there was a, one show in particular that was sort of an inspiration to me. It was called Matt's Today in History. And it was a, a short scripted podcast, a lot like Grammar Girl. And I heard that and I'm like, that, that's the kind of show I like. And then, so when I wanted to make my own show, that was what I wanted to do. So as a word person... What's the difference between written and spoken word? Oh, it's so different. It's so funny. The The biggest difference I find is with adverbs. When we speak, we use adverbs a lot for emphasis, just like I just did, a lot for emphasis. It's really important. This is absolutely the best this or that. You know, we use absolutely, really a lot. We use those words all the time and they make us sound natural and authentic when we speak. They look ridiculous in text. So if I'm taking a script, my podcast is scripted. I write the script first and then not anymore so much, but we used to put all the scripts online as articles. And the biggest difference I would make is to take out almost all the adverbs. <laughs> okay. That's helpful. Yeah. It's interesting because I see people who want to get into books that are podcasters. Sometimes they'll release a transcript. I'm like, mm, no, no, that doesn't work. And it's interesting to me doing the audio version of my books. It's like, wow, that sounded weird when I read it. Yeah, I'm doing interviews now more. And when I look at transcripts, I don't speak in complete sentences. Some people do, some people don't. It's sort of a personal style thing, but many people don't. And I am someone who doesn't. And when I look at the transcript, I'm just like, oh, this is, this is embarrassing. I, got, I want to see this in print. <laughs> Was it weird for you being somebody who's into writing and into grammar, obviously? Uh, to do podcasting, it's a different medium, but, you know, people think, oh, it's just words, but it's like we're talking about, there are a lot of different elements of uh, delivering those words. It wasn't really weird for me. The other thing that happened when I started, around the time when I started podcasting, is I had like a repetitive injury on my wrist, a repetitive stress injury. And so I had started using Dragon Naturally Speaking for my computer. And so I had a microphone and I was used to talking. And I guess I, in that sense, I was talking in complete sentences because I had to be, but it requires a, a kind of concentration that doesn't carry over into when I'm having a normal conversation. But I had already gotten used to speaking into a microphone before I started. Quick and dirty tips, team. It's not just you. Right. You mentioned it was you. It sounded like it was you at the very beginning. And this thing took off. It's CNN. It's This American Life. And it's you. When did the team come in? Pretty quickly. Yeah. So um, I did it all by myself for about six months. And, it, you know, I was also working as a freelance science and technology writer because at that time podcasting wasn't making any money. So I just like worked like a mad woman for about six months by myself. And I was desperately looking for a partner to help and um, talk to a few different companies, but ended up just really hitting it off with the people at Macmillan Publishing. They had originally approached me about a book deal, and I was like, I need a partner for the whole network. And and they had a digital initiative at the time. So it was just really good timing, really good fit. And the podcast was what brought them to you for the book deal? The Wall Street Journal picked the Grammar Girl website as their web pick of the day. I think it was because of the podcast. After that happened, I got calls from five New York publishers wanting to do a book deal because it wasn't that long after Eats Shoots. From the Wall Street Journal. 
So I'm like, oh, so the publishers read the Wall Street Journal, do they? <laughs> Man, it, what a great time that was, wasn't it? Where like one mention could get you this kind of heat. It was astonishing. <laughs> I mean, how did they even get my phone number? You know, then it was one person at Macmillan and then two people at Macmillan on the Quick and Dirty Tips team. And and now there are four people. And at that point, I had because because I worked in Silicon Valley during the dot com boom, I knew that with the kind of traffic I had, I had a business even though it, it wasn't clear what that business was going to be at the time. And so I, I started the Quick and Dirty Tips Network. And by the time I partnered with Macmillan, I had six or seven shows going. Uh, did Macmillan, did they know audio? Or were you educated? Well, yeah, they it? do audio books. So. Okay. Okay. But do, yeah. do you feel like they knew like broadcast audio, like podcasting, radio, something beyond audio books? Yeah. I have always felt really good. They have people who used to be at NPR on their audiobooks team. And we use contractors for our audio production. So they're not doing the audio production work. Right. They manage the process really well. I think they totally get it. Did they change your process? Did you find out? No. Like, hey, oh, okay. Because so, no. I'm curious how people jump into podcasting. Like I said, I came in from radio. So we handled it like radio. And I almost didn't know that podcasting existed i was in a silo mm -hmm. and then you get to the podcasters and you found that like they've forged their own path because they didn't know radio the podcasting community is wonderful and i learned everything i know about podcasting just from chatting with people you know way back in the early days on forums and then later on social media People are so supportive and helpful if you ever have a question you can find someone to answer it that setup that you had is the setup or very similar to the setup that you continued with McMillan and then you're doing now. Basically, yeah. Back in 2009, they took over the day-to-day -day operations of the network. Up till then, I was sort of managing the daily process as well as producing Grammar Girl. And it became clear at that point that I couldn't do both. I had to choose whether I wanted to be Grammar Girl or be the, you know, business executive and the day-to-day -day manager. And it's a lot easier to find someone else to do the business side than it is to find someone else to do the Grammar Girl side. Yeah. So, and I enjoy that more too. So at that point, I rejiggered our partnership and they took over day-to-day -day operations. You mentioned multiple shows. Let's talk about those multiple shows and how those came about? Because you start with one. Everybody starts with one. How quickly were the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth shows added? Yeah, gosh, it was pretty quick. I would say it was maybe two months when um, my co-host from the science podcast that I mentioned approached me about wanting to do a show about manners. And, you know, he was great. And so he was, you know, Mr. Manners. And, and then um, when Miss Manners had a legal problem with that. It became Modern Manners guy. <laughs> Did she come after you guys? We got a letter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did say, gentle reader, I'm suing you. That, that's how <laughs> she always does her column. I just remember Macmillan's lawyers said, you don't want to mess with her. <laughs> no, no. That's probably one of the biggest syndicated columns that there is. Yeah. They were like, just change the name. We don't you don't want to do this. <laughs> so, yeah. And so that was really quick. And then really the all the original hosts were someone I knew personally, a friend. You know, I had a neighbor who was really good with money and she became the first money girl. And one of my good podcasting friends when I was living in Arizona, you know, I thought she was a great mom and she became the mighty mommy. Um, you know, what M Mr. Manners' friend who was a lawyer became the legal lad. You know, we had, it was just, pe you know, people I knew and uh, it was a fun group. I mean, it's still a fun group, but it was, you know, a lot more informal in the beginning. I mentioned you in my book, Big Podcast, because you did not put your photo on art. There is a caricature of you. Right. Which I thought was genius. And you've got this name, Grammar Girl, which is easier pronounced than Ming Yang Fogarty for a lot <laughs> right. of people. And the reason I thought it was interesting, because coming from the music industry, we have bands like Kiss is doing this now, a Blue Man group. You know, there's about seven Blue Man groups that tour. And that's the reason they're always the top grossing tour of the year, because there's about seven of them on, on any given night. And I thought, OK, this is the same kind of thing. She can always switch out a grammar girl. We don't really know who she is. She's a caricature. Was that something you were thinking about or was it just like, hey, this is a cool icon? 
No, it was absolutely something I was thinking about. There were two reasons. First, grammar is really intimidating. And so I thought a friendly cartoon character would make it more fun and approachable. Like Mavis Beacon teaches typing. Yeah. But also, I wanted to build something that would last for a really long time and ideally beyond me. And having an avatar makes it a lot easier to bring in a different person. And over the years, you know, the hosts have changed for a lot of the shows, maybe almost all the shows. Yeah. You know, the, the the money girl we have now isn't the original money girl. The modern manners guy we have now isn't the original modern manners guy. And and I mean, you can, you can certainly change when you use someone's picture too, but I think it's maybe a little easier when you're using avatars. You know, one thing that I have been not worried about, but it's been on my mind more is with so much AI, you know, out in the world now right. that to distinguish ourselves, I think it's more important than ever to be a human and form a personal connection with your audience. And so I'm like, oh, but I'm this avatar, this cartoon right. character. Like, right. oh, how does that work? And I don't think it's a barrier because I'm myself on social media. And if you listen to the show, you know my personality, but it is something that crossed my mind. It's interesting you say that because this is another music analogy. There's something called quantize. And quantize would be where you take a drum beat and you make it perfect, like to the millisecond. And it doesn't sound natural. People's ears like, wait a minute, a real drum beat is going to be just a little bit off. And I feel that way with pacing of our speech. I feel that way with breath sound. There's other things that are cueing us into the human element of audio. AI just hasn't gotten that right yet. Maybe it will. But I also mm -hmm. wonder about even how we use words. Like some people have, there's probably a name for this. You would know it. You know, like phrasing, you know, certain um, catch oh, yeah. phrases it's that called, people have. It's called stylometrics. Oh, uh, that sounds awesome. Yeah, actually, I published a thing about it yesterday. I have a new AI newsletter because I'm so interested in it. And I published a thing yesterday about an AI detector that for the first time uses stylometrics to try to determine whether something's been written by AI or not. It's the way that an individual uses, you know, punctuation and word choice and sentence structure and all these different parameters of language. It's fascinating. It's actually how they determined 10 years ago that J.K. Rowling was the author behind the Google Oh, really? Rowling. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's interesting to me, too. The other thing, and this is, there's so many analogies that I brought over from music. One of the things we used to have is regional hits. So uh, back when media was not just like one station for the entire country, like satellite, we would have regional clusters of stations or just local stations and you would hear regional dialects regional words mm -hmm. and that stuff gets passed around the south where i am it can be different from where you are in california that's another thing that i'm not sure that the ai has really gotten because i don't even think we even notice them not consciously but we notice them subconsciously yeah. And you can give commands for it to do that, but you have to know too. I mean, I do, we brought, brought up breaths. That was something that came up really last week for me too. I recorded my podcast in a room that wasn't the room I normally record in and it didn't sound as good to me. And so, you know, we used a script for our editing and I love, I love Descript. It's, it's so much, but I had never used their studio sound feature before. So I applied studio sound to try to clean up the audio. I, I think that's an AI thing. It, it's some sort of fancy tool. It takes data and then it fills in the missing data, what it thinks based yeah. on AI. And it did sound better, but it removed all the breaths. Yeah. And that is not what I was expecting it to do. And it, and yeah. it did. I, it, it sounded different. Sometimes people feel it's rushed feels rushed because you're kind of waiting for somebody to take a breath. I think that's because we do that in conversation. Yeah. And it's got you on the edge of your seat waiting to jump in with somebody. I, I don't, it, yeah, it is pretty fascinating. There's a lot of podcasting and it's just why I was going there with you. Like the things that we learn, some of it's just being in the studio, I think, and others, you just wouldn't be aware until you had years of experience or maybe personal preference. I think I breathe a little loudly when I listen to other podcasts. <laughs> <But>. <laughs> I will de breath you. <laughs> you got national you engineers on this yeah what do you think about podcasting compared to other media we talked about wall street journal uh, other media you've been in the new york times we haven't even talked about that you're a best-selling author yeah so you've at least been in the chart of the new york times oprah had you on yeah broadcast radio what do you think about approaching other media for somebody who's into podcasting now who wants to expand? 
think it's great if you can. I think you want to be everywhere you can possibly be. I had a colleague in the J school, um, Carrie Barber, who taught um, documentary filmmaking. And the advice she gave her students, which is absolutely true, is your work starts when you finish your project that you're creating. When you finish your film, that's when your work starts. Because if you make it and then you don't tell anyone about it, you may as well have not made it. It's really important to be out there promoting your own work. And I know I don't love it as much as creating things either. Like we do these things because we love to create. But if you don't do the rest of the work to let people know about what you've created, that's not great. I think any chance you can get, you should be talking to journalists and print and TV and radio and whatever you can to get your message out there. Let's dive in a little bit more on that because I've got the book in front of me, Grammar Daily. This is the new one, which I love. 365 quick tips. You can do one a day in a year. Some people read the Bible in a year. You could become a grammarian in a year. <laughs> when I look at it, New York Times bestselling author, as somebody who sold a lot of books but never hit the New York Times list, I know what it takes to do that. And you've got to have something beyond a podcast, I think. Let's talk about what has made you Grammar Girl. Podcasting is one of those things. But what is it that you do when, like well, right now you're doing it because you've, uh, you're have you on the, the press tour, I suppose, for the Grammar Daily. And what is it that makes Grammar Girl, Grammar Girl, not just another podcaster that's getting ignored? People tell me it's my enthusiasm for the subject because when you listen to the show or you read my books, you can tell that... I just get excited about language. Like, I think it's so cool and I love it and I love talking about it. I love learning about it. Sometimes I joke that my podcast exists because my husband just got tired of hearing me tell him these exciting, <laughs> fascinating things. I just learned about some word. You know? Yeah, yeah. Like, you were podcasting before podcasting was a thing. Didn't know it. <laughs> right. Yeah. I just when I discover interesting things, I just have to share them and yeah. and I get really excited about them and people say that it's the enthusiasm. And also, you know, my goal is to help people. The podcast kind of has two elements. There's the help you write better and then there's the entertain you and tell you about some cool language thing I discovered like wow, isn't language cool? Yeah. You know, people find it useful, they find it entertaining. That was one thing I always told my students. It's like if you want to be a successful content producer, you need to either be educational or entertaining. And it's better if you can be both. Well, I think you can see yourself in it or you can see people that you know. Like when you talk about the history of a word, I'll give you an example. My grandmother, she called lunch dinner and she called mm -hmm. dinner supper. Yeah. There's a history behind why she did that. She would say, I'm fixing to. There's a history. It's not just redneck Nashville English. I mean, it's the King's English that, uh, from my understanding, that that happened, right? Yeah, I love fixing. That's a good Yeah, right? So yeah. I've told you talk about do the needful. I mean, you 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 know these these phrases that people use and, and you tell the story behind them and I think it makes you connect to your friends better, connect to yourself better. I think that's something that really a, a lot of the stuff that you do has going for it. Yeah, I, I, I love it. I really love it. How has podcasting helped your career? Oh my gosh. I, I mean, I wouldn't have a career, even being able to be a professor in the J school. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a PhD dropout from science. And I, one of the reasons I was in a PhD program is I thought I would love being a professor. I wanted to teach, but then I ended up doing research and I thought I would never be a professor. I thought that that was behind me. And then I was invited to speak at the J school where I lived about podcasting. And when they met me, they said, we have an open position that is like exactly what you do. I was the chair of media entrepreneurship and I had founded a podcasting network and I was, you know, like a, a podcast, you know, I, it, it was, I was exactly what they were looking for. And they then said, apply for this job. And, and so I got to be a professor, <laughs> which I thought was completely something I would never do all because of the podcast. I was on Oprah because of the podcast. I've been able to do the most amazing things because of the podcast. And I feel just incredibly lucky. It's changed my life. How do you feel the character of Grammar Girl? Can we call her a character? Because it's you, yeah. but it's a, a nickname. It's a, it's a, it's a weird thing. Yeah. yeah. Th that has, has that helped you? 
I, yes, it's catchy, it's alliterative, it's memorable, it's friendly. I think it has in no doubt contributed to the success of the podcast. It is a weird thing because, uh, you know, on, on social media, sometimes I'm like, am I a brand? Am I a person? You know, what am I? Because when people see you, they hey, grandma girl. Like, it's, yeah. it's not even your name, right? It's... Yeah, and I don't mind that. that that's, that's fine. But sometimes if I post a picture, people are like, oh, my God, it never occurred to me you're a real person. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know? Right. It's a little weird, but I think it works most of the time. You talked about the other shows you've got on the network, and everybody's a character on your network. Yeah. Are we calling them characters? There's a... Uh, I guess, yeah. There's a role they're playing, maybe? How does that work when, let's say I come onto your network and I'm the podcast guy. Uh, mm -hmm. Can I be David Hooper or am I the podcast guy? Can you talk more about that? And, well, you're you... both. You, you okay. start the show and say, I'm David Hooper, the podcast guy. Has that been an issue ever with finding talent? No, nobody's minded. No, people get I have like the longtime hosts. I know one of them told me she's really attached to her avatar. <laughs> They changed the logos a while ago, so not all the logos have the cartoon character on the you know square that you see on podcast platforms. And and one of the hosts was really sad when her her avatar went away. <laughs> <laughs> Does the network own the character? Is it like WWE, where the wrestlers are not the people who are playing the wrestlers? If that makes sense. Yeah, we own the brands and the shows. Podcasting is a grind, and people usually find they don't want to do it forever. And so when they want to go do something else, like we've invested a lot in developing the show. So we we keep the show and get a new host. And that was that was something too that came on from the very beginning when I started. I had been involved in another podcast network just as a member and it was very loosely organized. And it just didn't work. Right. You couldn't get anyone to do anything, <laughs> you know, like it was willy nilly all over the place. It it just in my experience, it just didn't work. And I wanted to build something stable and enduring. Will you talk more about that? Let's talk about one, finding the right people. You mentioned your friends, which a lot of people start out with, but th that can be tricky too, because you've yeah. got a pre-existing relationship and sometimes things aren't clear. This is one of the reasons I love a prenup. It's not that you don't trust people, but it's in writing and it gets, because people hear different things in a contract negotiation. Yeah. Do you have uh, everything in writing, I'm assuming? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Macmillan Legal. That's a wonderful thing about being partnered with Macmillan is their legal department takes care of all that stuff. But yeah, I mean, I not for any one particular reason, but I have a, a rule now that I don't work with friends. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Tell me a story. I'm going to give you any of the stories that you've got. I want to know when a partnership in podcasting has worked. And then I want you to flip that and give an example when is something that happened that didn't work and what do people need to watch out for? Hmm. I don't think I want to answer that question. Is it messy? Let me uh, just let me think for a sec. Okay. I think my partnership with Macmillan over 16 years now or something has really worked. And it's because we have really detailed legal contracts, <laughs> you know, about who is responsible for what. And if there's a misunderstanding, like there can't be a misunderstanding because you can pull out the contract and say, how is this supposed to work? Or how is that supposed to work? Or who gets what? Or who has to do what? Right. And I think having just clear, detailed contract, I mean, my contract is you know, now it's with the, with the amendments and stuff. It's, it's probably, longer. Yeah, it's like a quarter inch, half an inch thick. It's long. Whoa. You know, it covers a lot. And, you know, probably once or twice a year, I pull it out and look something up and say, okay, what happens in this situation? What am I responsible for? Or what are they responsible for? What do we need to do here? And I, I dread every time I have to pull it out and look through it, but it's there for a reason and it makes everything work because you can get past the emotions or the feelings about what should happen in some situation. And you just know, okay, here, it's written down. We do this. I agreed to that. You agreed to that. Whatever it is, it's not about feelings. It's about what you agreed to. And 17 years in, you've got the process down because that's 
probably changed a little bit over the last 17 years? A little bit. Yeah. You know, when we switched hosts and things like that, or when, you know, when they took over uh, back in 2009, that was a big change. And, you know, we've had website updates that have changed the way things work. And yeah, there, you know, things change. Can you talk about the process? How does that work? Because you're doing it every week, new episode every week. And sometimes they're interviews, sometimes not. Talk about kind of the day in the life of putting together one of these episodes. It's multiple days, I'm assuming. Yeah, well, it, the, the original kind, the scripted shows are still, you know, very much the way they were in the beginning. Like I write a script and I work with guest writers now, which has been a huge help. I hire occasionally, you know, linguists and and good writers to write scripts for me. And that's been a huge help. So either I write it or I edit it and put the script together and then send it to my editor at Quick and Dirty Tips to edit it, review it, give me feedback. You know, then I record it. I send it to my producer and they handle everything from there. It goes up on Simplecast and then I promote it on my social media. Um, some things that have changed in the last year or so, you know, like everyone else, we're thinking about video and how that fits into our workflow. And we've tried a whole bunch of different things. Oh, it's been so frustrating. It's been fun. I love new technology. It's been really fun. But and frustrating. frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we've tried multiple different kinds of video, on, you know, um, me just sitting here recording the show and slides, you know, stock art and just the whole show, just one segment from the show. We've tried a bunch of different things. So that has been an enormous amount of back and forth and tweaking our workflow and who does what. And How did you feel about the video? Were you excited about it? I mean, a lot of yeah. people, people seem to love it or hate. It. I don't like it. I see why people do. It's so funny. I love making it. But I shouldn't make it because it's not the best use of my time. Yeah. I should let someone else make it. Um, and then it took me a long time to get used to people just putting it up there. Like my husband would joke. He's like, you make videos and then you don't tell anyone about them because you don't want them to look at you. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, like, right. and it's like my friend, like my friend Carrie Barber. It's like, what's the point of making a video if then you don't tell anyone about it and you wish they wouldn't watch it? <laughs> you know. Well, there's a million things that people don't, maybe think about it unless you've done it. But for me, I love privacy though. Yeah. And this is coming from the entertainment industry. Like I know people, they can't go anywhere without folks knowing who they are. Now they're bigger than you or I are, but you'd be surprised that people recognize even YouTubers all the time. And it's like, ah, that, that kind of scares me a little bit, honestly. Did me you, too. Did you, yeah, talk, I hate talk, it. We'll talk more about it because that, that's where I'm going with it because with the, the caricature, like your photo wasn't on there, which I think is a smart reason. But that's another one of those benefits is that we can kind of be anonymous in podcasting. That's something a lot of people don't think about. I think that's it, why it works for some people. Yeah, no, I re I value my privacy too. And I, it, you know, I when I make video, I try to make it in a way that won't reveal too much about my personal life or where I am and stuff. And it, it's funny, I do these TikTok or videos or reels where I'm out in my neighborhood walking around, I try to do it in a place where you can't see house yeah. numbers or, you know, like, yeah. like I do it in a park, not, not in my neighborhood. And, but I have this, I, like, I just have this favorite hat that I wear and just because it blocks the sun. But then now when I'm out wearing my hat, walking around, just when I'm not recording, I'm like, oh, are people going to recognize uh -oh. me from my hat? I hate that. Right. <laughs> well, everybody says they want to be recognized until it actually happens. And Again, you've got to be a pretty big star for this to happen, but some people can't turn it off. Yeah, I just want to buy my lettuce in peace, you right. know? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if you're Taylor Swift at Costco, uh, it ain't happening. I mean, your life is forever changed. And again, it's a different level, but it doesn't take that much to disrupt your day-to-day. -day. Let's say you want to get a workout in the gym. or I, I know people that they can't even get a job at Starbucks because the world that we are in, people think you're all rich and famous, and you might have famous but not necessarily rich. They can't get a job that's public facing because it disrupts everything. So yeah, I really am not recognized very often. That, but the funny, the one time that I was recognized is years and years ago. But um, I had like a breast lump that turned out to be benign. But I was getting a biopsy, and the nurse is like, "You're Grammar Girl." I'm like, "Can we just pay attention here?" <laughs> you know, like it's like the worst time to be recognized. That's exactly the point that I'm saying is like people. <laughs> you 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 really appreciate your privacy on a moment like that, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> anyway, all right, let me um, mention something I mentioned earlier. Is a New York Times bestselling author. Has that changed anything for you? Because that is one of the holy grails of authorship. And there are certainly podcasting versions of that we can all connect with. I don't think it's changed that much. I am incredibly proud of it. I joke all the time. It's going in my obituary, you know, and I'm sure it gives me uh, an aura of credibility that doesn't come with just being, you know, a podcaster, like a lot more people understand right. what that means. Right. And I think if I wanted to make more of a career of public speaking. You know, there are people who do that. It's a fabulous way to make a really good living. I just don't particularly enjoy it. But if I did, I think it would be very helpful. Have you had opportunities for public speaking? You seem like the kind of person, you got opportunities for book deals. I imagine people are wanting you to speak too. Yeah, no, I, there have been times when I've done a lot of speaking, not a lot, like maybe five or six times a year, you know, I would do that. That can feel like a lot. Yeah. I just found that I don't really enjoy it. So I don't seek it out. People still approach me sometimes, but because I never, ever market it or seek it out or try to get those kind of gigs, but I'm sure if I wanted to, I could. And I'm sure if I wanted to, having that New York Times bestseller sticker on my butt (laughs) would would help. (laughs) That's the thing I I think a lot of people, if they get into the content business, whatever that is, a book, a podcast, a radio show, you think it's going to be one thing that does it for you. But it seems to be a lot of, at least my experience has, a lot of what you're doing. You've got the book, You've got some speaking, maybe not a lot. You've got a network. You've got uh, social media. It, it's not one thing. It's everything, maybe all the time. Do you ever feel like you can shut it off? No. <laughs> but I feel really strongly about what you're talking about, is having the multiple revenue sources as a small content creator, as a small business. You need to have as much diversified income as you can because every year something goes wrong. Yeah. You know, right now our web revenue is way down, but the podcast revenue is doing fantastic and I have a new book coming out and right. you know even though I don't enjoy speaking, I know I'll never starve because I can speak if I need to, <laughs> you know. And I have games and you're right, I'm on social media and I do do video and and I just think having as many it, it just makes you a lot safer to have yeah. multiple sources of income. Yeah, I've seen this with distribution points as well. If you've got one book distributor or one audiobook distributor, if they cut you loose and that happens, yeah. uh, then what are you going to do? So yeah, it's good to be diverse. Well, the new book, The Grammar Daily, I love it. I have learned so much from you in writing my book. And I think that your content is a great example of what we can all do as podcasters is you give people a little bit of a taste and they think, oh, I like that. And you get more of it and more of it and more of it and more of it. And next thing you know, you're reading Grammar Daily every day. Hmm. And uh, it's certainly helped my writing. Although I was really nervous to send you a copy of my book. I said, don't judge the grammar, please. And you said, I don't judge. I don't. No. <laughs> and thank you so much for having me on. And I have to say, your podcasting newsletter is one of my favorites. So if anyone's listening, if you aren't subscribed yet, subscribe to David's newsletter. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. Well, that means a lot. I mean, it's always great to have like a host who recognizes your hosting or somebody who would recognize your writing. But I just like spreading a message. And I love memes. And I love songs. This comes from my music background, too. That You have to give a message in three minutes and 30 seconds and rhyme and, and make it catchy. And I, I love spreading a message. And I think that that's what grammar helps us do. If nothing else, you get better clarity for your message. Yeah. And I learned that. The Oxford comma. <laughs> a contentious comma. <laughs> you and I are going to die on that hill. Well, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Ming Yang Fogarty on Build a Big Podcast. I love that. You know what I love about her? She's enthusiastic, man. How great is it when you've got to work with somebody and he's super enthusiastic? I love that about Ming Young. This is the absolute best way to build an audience. And I think that's a big part of her success. Look at what she's been able to do. I mentioned this at the beginning of the episode and a little bit in the interview. The Grammar Daily, that's her latest book. 365 Quick Tips for Successful Writing or Podcasting. I changed the title for her. This is going to help you as a podcaster because it's helping you clarify your message, get your message out more clearly 
make your message understood by people. And she's made it easy. One thing a day, 365 days, one year from now, you're going to be a master communicator. Impress your high school English teacher. Hey, true story about that to wrap this thing up in a nice bow. I grew up with a guy's name is Jad Boomrad. And Jad is known to most people as the host, founder, the guy from a podcast and radio show called Radio Lab. Big NPR show. My book that I mentioned with Grammar Girl in it, big podcast, I wrote this book and I wanted a Ford for it. And I knew Jad. And I thought, man, how cool would it be if Jad would do the Ford for my book? That's going to be great because everybody knows Jad and NPR and Radio Lab. And some of that credibility that he's got, maybe it'll rub off onto me. But the biggest reason that I wanted to do that was Jad and I, we went to school together for nine years. We're in junior high. <laughs> we had English together. And we did a project together. And my English teacher loved it. Mrs. Venable. And I wrote him and I said, hey, man, this would be really impressive to Ms. Venable. <laughs> that was my in. I mean, look, she was amazing. And I think she saw something in me. But at the same time, I was also in a remedial English class, you know? I mean, everybody else was learning Spanish or French. And me, they said, nah, nah, this guy. We got to take him back to English 101. So I thought, man, I'm going to go back there. I'm going to show her that I did something with myself. I've written this book. And not only that, the guy I was in the class with, not the remedial class, the normal English class. I was in two English classes in junior high. Jad Aboomrad, he has done the Ford. He said no. He actually didn't say anything. Didn't hear back from him. <laughs> so I carry on. Like Grammar Girl, always looking for somebody to partner up with. Maybe not on a Ford, but I'd love to tell your story in these books that I'm working on. So be in touch, man. Bigpodcast.com. That's how to do it. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, this is how to make that happen. Bigpodcast.com slash subscribe. I've made it very easy for you. I've got three buttons. One for Android. One for iPhone. One is an RSS feed. Click the one that you want. You're immediately subscribed to Build a Big Podcast. You will never miss an episode. And if you don't want to touch anything, you can scan the QR code. Same thing. You're immediately subscribed to Build a Big Podcast and you never miss an episode of me talking about growing your audience, getting more people to your podcast, making money with your podcast. Bigpodcast.com slash subscribe. Go there now before you forget. And I'll see you on the next episode of Build a Big Podcast.